Greetings, welcome back to Old Ways Rising Farm. We're going to do a bit of a chalk talk today and we're going to talk about making stone walls stay up, right? We want to make stone walls stay up. If you're on a farm, if you're on a homestead, even if you're just in a larger suburban lot, you're eventually probably going to want to build something with stones. Stone walls are beautiful, they're nostalgic, they're wonderful pieces of a, an agri agrarian landscape, or any landscape for that matter. And it is sadly very easy to walk around a suburban environment in particular where a lot of people have done a lot of stone walls with varying degrees of skill, we'll just say, and find ones that are not staying up, right? I love building with stone, I find it enjoyable, but stones are heavy and I don't enjoy rebuilding with stone, <laughs> right? I want to do it once and have it stay. This is particularly true of retaining walls. Retaining walls are a different beast from freestanding walls, okay, and we'll talk about all of that. So this is going to be a, a chalk talk video where we go over the basics, we go over the principles. And then later we're almost finished with the planting season and as soon as we are we will go out and we will start doing some building and infrastructure projects which is sort of the summer stage of managing a farm the infrastructure repair and construction so we have some stone building projects coming up this year and next year and we'll take you along for that ride but i wanted to take a moment before we get into that and go over some of the basics so that when I'm you do, producing those videos, I can reference this one and you, the audience, can have a um, understanding of what's going on. So if you're enjoying this, please give the video a thumbs up and that will help YouTube algorithm know to show it to other folks. And let's get into it. So there's a couple of strategies for getting things to stay up. Um, the first and the absolute simplest is pile things at the natural angle of repose. Okay? If you pile something at the natural angle of repose, it will stay up basically forever, regardless of your skill. Okay? This is the simplest and in many ways the least interesting of the three ways of getting something to stay up. So what is the natural angle of repose? Well, if you think about taking a dump truck load of stone or sand or dirt or anything and you pile it, you get a fairly consistent angle in the slope of your pile. And what's going on is the stones or particles of whatever you happen to have dumped out of the dump truck, they're not aligned with any particular grace or skill. They're just sitting there. Some want to sit where they are, some want to fall over, some want to wedge in between and push their neighbors over. Okay. So you have all of this random arrangement trying to, every individual stone being in a non-optimal position, trying to fall over. But, and if you have, if you pile this like at a vertical wall and then remove the wall, it will immediately slump because of that. Mm -hmm. But it will only slump so far because the, uh, there is friction in between those particles. And at a certain angle, the resistance to movement provided by the friction is greater than the force of the unstable particles trying to fall over. And that angle is your angle of repose for a certain material. It is different for different materials. So most stone and gravel is around a 45 degree angle, right? Go, again, just drive around after watching this video, just pay attention to your environment a little bit and when you see construction and you see a pile of things, look at them. Usually it's going to be pretty close to a 45 degree angle. You'll start to notice this. Okay? So the, um, that's the most common. Um, clay is, a little, is a, a little shallower. Wet clay is 15 degrees. It will slump all the way to a 15 degree. Um, dry lumps of clay about 40, 40 degrees because the dry lumps of clay are structurally weak and they will um, kind of crush at the edges and slump a little bit further than rocks would in the same environment. Sand, dry sand is 34 degrees, um, damp sand is 45. Uh, I'm sure you've noticed this difference if you've ever built a sand castle. If you moisten the sand, you can get it to hold a uh, more 
closer to vertical shape. And with excess water in the clay, it goes down again to 15 degrees. This is why clay and sand, and so I didn't put silt up here, but it's in the same category. Um, this is why these materials are so easily eroded because they change from a relatively steep to a shallow angle of repose when you add water. Mm. Okay, so as soon as this gets has excess water, a little bit of water can help, too much water bad, and as soon as you get some excess water, the water lubricates these intersections and it goes from a steep to a shallow angle of repose, slumps out and you start the erosion process. Okay, So understanding the angle of repose is an important first step in understanding how to keep something up. Are there things we build at the natural angle of repose? Yes, they are. Uh, the pyramids are built pretty close to a 45 degree angle. They are pretty much built at the natural angle of repose. They are considered wonders of the world. Frankly, they're not one of the wonders of the world that impresses me all that much because, and I'm, I don't mean to throw, sh throw too much shade there, but they're built at the natural angle of repose. Yes, kudos for observation, but what the pyramids prove is that if you are willing to enslave your entire population, you can build a big pile of dirt. Like, I think we kind of already knew that. Um, so they're built at the natural angle of repose. They screwed up on one, the bent pyramid, they built it too steep, and then they had to go back to the natural angle of repose at the top. <laughs> okay? So there's really not any engineering in here. A step up from the pyramids are dams. Uh, well, I mean, there's there's some engineering. Yes, it's, it's kind of cool for the time period in which they were built. But, you know, uh, still. Dams. Dams are typically built at the angle of repose for your particular material. So you have angle of repose up, a flat, and angle of repose back down. And then in the middle, you'll have a key, which is a bank of uh, water impervious material that keeps it from leaking. And then we have water here, okay? Now, if you look at the forces in the dam, this is very stable because it's built at the angle of repose. We're not trying to be graceful when we build a dam. We're trying to be strong when we build a dam. But something to keep in mind is this material is forced down because gravity is pulling it down. So we have that force vector drawn vertically down. The water is pushing has hydraulic pressure sideways, and of course down as well, okay? Now, this direction of force trying to push the dam over, um, an engineer, a dam takes a whole lot more engineering than a pyramid does. Pyramid, simple, damn complicated, because you have to calculate the weight of this dam to be strong enough to not get pushed over by the horizontal force of the water. This is gonna be crucial for retaining walls. We're going to come back to this idea. Okay. Now, we are resisting that force with uh, vertical friction, but vertical friction does not win forever. Eventually, this unbalanced force situation will result in water winning. Okay. If you build this dam well and it's a shallow pond, it might silt up all the way full before water wins but water will eventually win. Water always eventually wins. Okay, all dams are temporary, just accept that. The only way, like I said, the only way the dam won't break is if it silts up faster, okay? All dams eventually break. The bigger the dam, the deeper the pool, the uh, more tenuous the situation because the greater the force imbalance, okay? So here we're just using gravity and friction to resist that, but it won't resist it forever. When you're building a retaining wall, you have similar things going on and you're not building it with the engineering skill of a dam, okay? Now, before I talk about freestanding walls and retaining walls, I want to be very clear about something. I am not a civil engineer. This video is not intended to teach you how to build a foundation for your house or any other building. This video is not intended to teach you how to build a dam. If you're going to build this, you need to hire a civil engineer, okay? I am not one, you are not one. Well, unless you are, then you can hire yourself. But <laughs> unless you are actually a civil engineer, you need a civil engineer's help 
to design that sort of project. What this video is intended to, to do is to help you build small scale garden structures. Okay, We're talking stone retained raised beds. We're talking decorative stone walls. We're talking stone fences if you want to do you know, like traditional European stone fences for animal husbandry. We're talking that scale of building. Okay, Do not watch this video and think you know how to build a house. You don't get over it, hire a civil engineer, okay? So, that's my disclaimer for this video. I just want to be very clear at the scale of, of, of uh, building that I'm talking about, mm -hmm. okay? Um, you know, things that are safe, things that are not going to topple on you. Once it gets tall enough that, you could, that it could topple on a toddler, you need to hire a civil engineer to manage the situation, mm -hmm. okay? So, the, uh, uh, the first of the decorative stone structures I want to talk about is a freestanding stone wall. Now, we want to go, you could build a freestanding stone wall just at the angle of repose just by dumping rocks. It will stand. It won't be that attractive. We want to build a nice stone wall with relatively straight uh, relatively straight sides, right? So, what I want to talk about here is dry laid stone. Okay. There's a couple of rules that we need to apply to do good dry laid stone. Okay. The first is the one on two, two on one rule. So everywhere that I've drawn a stone, you see everywhere there's a crack between stones, there's another stone directly on top of it, okay? All of the stones cover a crack, all of the cracks are covered by a stone. That keeps it stable. Because mm -hmm. what's happening is the friction of the downforce of this stone is exerted on both of these adjoining stones and it holds it together, mm -hmm. okay? Now, dry laid stone is flexible. The, the frost, also be clear if this is your first video, I'm doing this video in New York, in northeastern, north, in northeastern United States, in North America. Temperate climate, cold winters, we have frost heave, okay? If you are watching this from, you know, Hawaii or Brazil, you don't need to worry about frost heave. You can disregard what I'm about to say. But um, frost heave is going to lift and lower these stones every year, okay? One of the advantages that dry laid stone has over mortar is that it is not rigid. It is flexible. These rocks will, you know, heave up and flex a little bit, and they'll just move slightly relative to each other. And for your first three or four years, they'll wiggle a little bit each year until they find their actual true most stable position, and then they'll never move again. Okay. Relative to each other. They'll move up and down every year and just won't matter. So when you're doing dry laid stone, you can have a shallow foundation, one stone thick underneath of those, still one on two, two on one, okay? You only need to go down one stone. This is just going to anchor it into the ground so it doesn't slide horizontally on the hill, okay? Um, and you can get away with this just very shallow foundation. It will heave, it will move, but you've designed for that movement, so it's okay. If you are going to mortar this, you need to recognize two things. One is that it's going to make it rigid. So if you're going to mortar this, you need to set a deep foundation, which is deeper than the frost line. Okay? And you need to go down with stone to the frost line and then have six inches or so of gravel underneath it so that water can drain out. Hmm. Okay? That's a heck of a lot of work for this little stone wall. If you don't do this, your wall will crack and fall apart in a couple of years. Okay? Um, if you dry lay, that doesn't need to, that's not going to be a problem. Now, second thing you need to recognize is that mortar is not glue. 
Repeat that after me. Mortar is not glue. Okay? Thank you, honey. <laughs> Happy to be a Do it one more time. Mortar, mortar is, is not, not glue. glue. Okay. What mortar does is it provides a surface which hardens to the exact surface texture of the stone. So it increases the friction between the stones, but it is not an adhesive. It does not glue them together. Okay. So if you build a stone wall that is not going to stay up without mortar, it will not stay up with mortar because mortar is, is not, not glue. glue. Okay. Um, so I would recommend you start with dry laid stone regardless. Okay. Mortar is a good tool, right? If you want to build something small that you don't want to shift around, go for it. Uh, one of the projects I have planned is to build some stone benches with a little arch underneath. They're only going to be, you know, maybe like two foot by four foot. Something like that can frost heave and wiggle around as a unit and it won't break apart. Mortar's great for that. I'm going to build a, a permanent forge out of mortared stone. Again, I want it to not shift around. It will probably be about four foot by four foot in total dimension. It will just rise and lower as a total lump. But once you go into long walls, you have to have this kind of deep foundation so that it can maintain rigidity. Mm -hmm. Or mortar will make things worse, not better. And because you have a mortar thickness, once it starts to crumble, because your wall's flexing and cracking, and starts to crumble out from between the rocks, it will actually fall apart faster than a poorly made dry laid wall. Mm -hmm. Okay? So bad quality mortar is worse than bad quality dry laid. Right, so you have to have, you have to be able to do this before you can mess with the other. Now, all of these rocks are flat and have their, you know, if we look at the force of gravity pulling them down, it's vector down. Okay, here's how to make a, a freestanding wall that <clears throat> falls apart quickly. We're going to have somewhere in this wall. I'm not going to draw all the stones. The thing that everybody's tempted to do where when we have triangular stones, you're always going to find a pile of stones, some triangles. Okay? Do not do this with them. This stone's cool, this stone's cool, this stone's cool. However, this top triangular stone, it has a net force which is down and out. It will slide out. Mortar or no mortar because mortar is not, not glue. glue. Okay. Uh, mortar or no mortar, that stone is going to work its way out of the wall and collapse your wall. Okay. Um, the more extreme that angle, the faster it will happen. So, where can you use these? Well, if you have a long span in your wall, and you have a couple triangles that are only triangular in one direction, what you can do is you can put them in the middle of the wall like this. Okay? So now, this triangle is down and in that way, this triangle is down and in that way, and their forces cancel. Mm -hmm. That will stay up. That's okay. Now, you have a big vertical joint here, so you have to make sure that the rest of the rocks above and around it are going to stabilize that section of the wall. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it is a weak point, um, and an experienced wall builder is probably going to roll their eyes at you, but your wall will stay up, okay? Uh, but, you know, if you have this, if this wall is multiple courses thick, you know, maybe, maybe this one here in the middle is where you did that, and all the rest of it will hold the thing together, okay? Mm -hmm. That's okay. That will stay up. That will stay up. It'll shift around a little bit, but it'll stay up. You're good. This provides a concept 
that is going to be really crucial for our um, retaining walls. Because if you build a retaining wall, and this is the third kind of walling that I'm going to talk about here today, and retaining walls are the most common ones that you see falling over. Because let's look at this. Let's say we just have a straight wall of some construction. I don't care what it is. And then we have, this was built into a bank. And so we've done some grading there. And here's the shape of the bank. Okay? And we'll say this is a, a well-built wall of some construction. I don't care what kind of construction it is. Um, dry laid stone will actually last the longest in this circumstance. Cinder block, the shortest. Those pre-made blocks that you, you know, get that lock together. It depends on how well, what quality of the concrete was. They can last, you know, almost as long as dry laid or just as short as cinder block, depending on the quality of the block. So we have this force down. We have the force of gravity on the soil, straight down. So far, so good. The problem is that rain is going to fall on this soil. It is going to fill up the soil, and you're going to have a horizontal force vector. They can't see that. They can't see the blue? Mm-mm. Okay. It's too, too late. These markers are dying. I have new markers ordered, but they didn't come yet. Next time we do a chalk talk, there will be new markers. Let's see if green shows up. Yep. That okay. Shows up. Green's good? Yep. Awesome. Thank you, hon. So we have water coming through, producing a horizontal force vector that will guarantee 10 out of 10 times topple that wall. I don't care what you made it out of. Again, a lot of people do this with cinder block and then try to decorate the front of it. Cinder block is extremely weak inside pressure. Mm -hmm. When we were looking for houses before we bought this place, every cinder block basement house that we looked at was cracked, stoved in, some stage of falling over. Mm -hmm. Okay? If there is clay in this soil, it makes this problem 10 times worse. If there is sand in the soil, it mitigates it a bit because the water drains out quickly. Right? So how fast this happens depends a lot on your soil conditions, but it will happen. If you're in super dry Arizona, yeah, you have some of your own rules, but um, it, it, it will happen eventually if you allow water to build up in the soil. There's two ways to fix this. One is to backfill. Instead of backfilling with gravel, I mean with, with soil directly, we're gonna backfill with gravel and then the soil line is going to be kind of here, okay? So what happens is the water comes in, starts to exert that pressure, but it's able to drain out quickly, so that pressure does not build up against the wall. If you backfill this wall with gravel, this is true of your house too, I, I'm not telling you how to build a house, but if you are building a house, make for crying out loud, make sure you backfill your foundation with gravel. It just boggles my mind that people will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on houses, but will not spend an extra two or three grand on gravel to keep the darn thing standing. Don't be stupid. Backfill with gravel. There we go. Rant over. Um, the, uh, the uh, uh, gravel will prevent this from happening for a while. Eventually, this water washing through will silt up the gravel. And there are things you can do to slow this process. You know, if you wrap the gravel in geotextiles, it will slow this process immensely so that it might take multiple human generations for this to happen. So when I say inevitable, I don't always mean fast. But it is inevitable that gravel will fill that up. Once gravel fills that up, the force of the water is now exerted against the wall and you start the toppling process. Mm -hmm. Okay? How can you build a wall that will be a good retaining wall and will prevent the toppling process forever without needing gravel? Well, we have to remember this. How I said this will stay because these forces counterbalance each other. Mm -hmm. We need, if we want to keep that up functionally forever, and I do mean on human terms forever. There are walls built the way, there are archaeological walls built the way that I'm describing that are thousands of years old. Okay? So, what we're going to do, here's our starting hill slide. We want to build a retaining wall here. We're going to put 
a stone down for a foundation, and we're going to put a stone up. We're going to backfill with soil. Okay? Now, the next course is a little wider than we backfill with soil. The next course is wider yet. Backfill with soil. The next course is full width. Okay? Now, we didn't backfill. We can put plants in the side. You know, if you do this, if you want to do a planted wall, and the first walls we're going to do on the channel are planted walls. They're going to be a strawberry bed. So you can't do a planted wall here because of all that gravel there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to have to be solid, solid, right? Here we have dirt right up against the wall. We can do a planted wall. We didn't have to purchase that gravel. We don't have the extra cutting excavation. We could just build it right against the existing slope. Okay. Why does this work? Where does my balancing vector come from? Well, let's look at the outline of what we just built. Okay, we built this. There's gravity here, but then there's also gravity here that wants to topple it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this wall wants to topple in that direction towards the hill. And then we have our hydraulic pressure. We have the down from here we have the hydraulic pressure, which add up to a net vector that way. Our wall has a net vector that way. They cancel. Okay. Your wall cannot compress the soil. So your wall can have a stronger vector here because it cannot compress the whole hillside and topple in. Your um, hydraulic pressure is trying to push it out but it's being balanced by that, I'm going to invent a word, in-toppling force. <laughs> I just coined that word, use it if you like. Um, <laughs> not going to trademark it. So we have our, our balancing vectors. This retaining wall will stand for functionally forever, as long as your materials hold up. If you're doing this, and again, I don't care what kind of material you're using. If you're using granite, this will last literally functionally forever on human terms. If you're using concrete, it will last until the concrete crumbles. If you're using concrete block. But it will last a very long time. You will not have built something which is going to be in the uh, neighbor scratching their head, why did that topple so quick category. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is how I like to build retaining walls, using this trick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, over time, what will happen and this is also part of why I like this method. Again, I'm only talking about non-mortared, dry laid wall construction here. Is when we pack this dirt in, no matter how you stomp this, it's going to compress a little bit more over time. So these stones are going to get a little bit of a down lean. You're going to kind of pick up here a little bit. And they're going to kind of roll backwards just a little bit. So over time, over the first two, three years of your wall, I love planted stone walls. Mm -hmm. Okay, They're going to tip up. They're going to make this area accessible for root growth. It's going to be good for the plants in your planted wall, in your rock garden. And it's going to get a natural little bit of back lean, which will help stabilize it further. Mm -hmm. It will evolve from this to this in about two or three years, which is from the frost heaving compaction. It's going to shift and find its natural position. In three years, it will look like it was there for 3,000 years, and it will not move again. Mm -hmm. So it's a very nice, you can build with a vertical face. It will evolve into a condition with a slight back lean, slight opening up. And then this will just settle down in. And even the bottom rock is going to, like, now here there's a little bit more pressure on the back than the front. So as this evolves, this is going to also get a little bit of back lean. Okay. So they'll have good mating surfaces. They're just perfect little bit of back lean, well anchored in the ground. It'll last for your lifetime and quite a few after you. Mm -hmm. And you'll have a beautiful wall that stays up. Okay. So we're going to show this principle 
soon. We have a little bit of planting to do. We are people of the seasons. With the planting season is almost through. Um, have a couple things that we need to knock in the ground yet. A um, couple of busy weeks coming up, so I don't know exactly when we're going to get to producing this video, but you'll see this coming up on the channel soon as we move into the midsummer infrastructure stage of managing a homestead. Mm -hmm. So I hope that you will like and subscribe. I hope that you will continue to watch with us and join us in this journey as we move forward on Old Ways Rising Farm. Till then, have a great day.